day. It seems like now it's uh, it's working, right? Can everyone hear me? Because I can't see anyone. <laughs> so, you know, just make sounds or something if you want to ask something uh, along the presentation or, uh, you know, amaze me <laughs> somehow and we'll, uh, we'll have a conversation. My name is Mihaela Giderza. I'm from Romania. I'm uh, a technical team lead for, uh, for Atera, uh, also uh, an MVP uh, for Microsoft on uh, developer technologies. So basically, I'm combining the technical part, you know, the passion for, uh, for this that we all share for technology, with sometimes presenting or sharing some knowledge that I have, um, writing on my blog. So being part of uh, events like this one today. So I really want to thank to the organizers for having me. I'm actually really lucky to have the opportunity to do what I really like, meeting new people, learning from you, maybe giving you some insight from my experience, you know, just having fun together. What I'm going to propose for you today as a conversation, it's a subject that's been, you know, along the way in my career. I've been meeting this sort of um, sort of issue, as in about how distributed teams will work, and especially when it comes to performance and the data that they share. And I would really like to, to learn also from experience, your experiences today. And um, I really think that teams are so different, and you'll see that there are a lot of scenarios and situations. So Really, I think we can add up to a two-way knowledge sharing today. So let's just get it on. You know, along the way in my career, I had the chance to be on the front-end part and then be more focused on the back-end part and do some DevOps and do some full stack and being a team lead. So I just uh, experienced with a lot, of, uh, a lot of context. But what I've seen, is that sometimes we don't really learn from the mistakes that we're making. And we kind of have the tendency of repeating, you know, some patterns, some way of doing things. And here I'm just going to refer to how we manage this kind of distributed teams when we have, you know, the client on a side with a team working or team or several teams working on, uh, on the client. And then the um, back-end services being managed by some different teams. So minding the gap between the client and the server, you know. And I'm sure that uh, you heard things like, if you had the experience of uh, being in one of uh, the sites or being in such a context, you had the experience to see that, you know, front-end developers just think, why can't back-end dev developers just change what we are asking? And why they can't understand that we can't know from the beginning all the requirements, so we need to change the set of data? And what are they doing every, you know, all day anyway? They're just extracting some data from the database and sending it to us, and we have to do all the, you know, very hard work in working with the user's needs and stuff like this, always uh, changing, you know? We are users, so we know very well how this works. And then we have the backend developers thinking like, why can't you just stop changing that payload? Like stop requesting stuff. And you know, why are you changing it so often? Can't you just say in the beginning what you need and finish with this? And in the end, I guess, I don't know if, if, of your experience, but for me, I always heard something like, yeah, front-end developers are just doing some HTML and some CSS and just doing things pretty. And why are they complaining so much about logic and changing stuff on the front-end? Well, you know, this maybe it's been at some point uh, valid. But if we look a bit at ourselves when we are acting as users, when we are using applications, all the needs that we have, we don't think that much. Maybe because we are tech people, we think about that also. But when I'm opening an application, I'm just thinking, um, this button shouldn't be here. And this is so, the flow in this application is so, you know, it's not intuitive. It's not helping me. And uh, well, this is not updating as it should. So I think that it's an issue of state management. So basically, you know, that mindset of, 
all the smart programming and all the important things such as uh, maintainability, uh, such as uh, state management, uh, uh, testability, API design, things that we thought that were on the backend side and the backend developers were focused on this. Well, it changed. All the context has changed because right now front-end developers are not doing the, you know, just moving pixels around. We have a lot of logic moved in the client part, in the way we interact with the application. So basically things that were the work of backend developers, right now it became also a part of the daily discussions of front-end developers. We have state management in the front-end part, and we have to deal with a lot of scenarios when it comes to how we share our data. We have to work with different devices and different browsers and test stuff and maintain stuff and see how we can extend what we are building. So basically, we are kind of in the same place when it comes to complexity. And the chaos, it starts in the moment when someone says from the front end part, I need some additional data in the UI. And then everyone goes crazy. Anyone is, uh, from the team is going crazy. It's like, oh my God, you know, all the questions that we had before. And it's very important to, to understand that, okay, for this might be all sorts of uh, different ways of, of dealing with, but we have to think in terms of performance, most of it. And the way that our application is going to work as a whole in the end. So we are not only think about, thinking about my part or your part. We are thinking about an ecosystem that we have to build. So in the moment that we want to do something like this, like add some additional data in the UI because the uh, developers need it, normally or usually we had two approaches, either add some data you know, to uh, an endpoint that we already use, or use, you know, re uh, add a new endpoint to work with uh, and that uh, satisfies the needs that we have. So let's discuss each of these cases and see exactly how they uh, how are working in a, you know, good situation and in a not so good situation. So basically just create a new endpoint and uh, use it. So let's say that we have this, uh, this freedom of creating a new endpoint and you know it's no issue with creating a new endpoint because yeah, it's just going to be uh, a new call over the, the network. So it's not a dramatic if you do this once. And then we are just thinking, OK, um, three months later, yeah, but I need another new endpoint. Hey, you backend guys, can you add another endpoint? And they are just doing it again, adding a new endpoint for the needs that we have and doing this you know, two, three, four times again and again until it becomes actual an issue. So in the moment where I have to, you know, have to deal with a lot of uh, a lot of calls and actually aggregate some data in the client side, which we are going to discuss a bit uh, later about uh, about this. But when we have a lot of back and forth communication with the backend, just by creating these endpoints for each and every single uh, small need that we have, we are creating chattiness, and this is not something that it helps a lot with the performance. Actually, it doesn't help at all. So we have to see exactly, oh, Michaela, you're saying that this uh, solution is not that good. Let's see the other one. Maybe we can add some properties uh, on an endpoint that we already have, on the payload that we already have. And let's say that we are in a very good communication with uh, the backend team. We just go to them. They are very open to adding uh, another, another um, uh, property to the payload. And then someone from another team or for my team actually uh, two weeks later saying, OK, but add also a property for me and someone else uh, again and again and again. And from a payload that had something like uh, five properties, now you have 20 properties that you have to work with. And trust me, I've been working with a case like this, so I'm not exaggerating at all. I'm not doing it for creating effect. It really happens. So when you are having something that is called a fat payload, so very big payload, again, you have a problem because you have to go over the network with this big payload. You have to parse it. And when it comes to developer experience where maybe you are just working in the team that is building the mobile interface. So you just need from that payload 
two properties. You have to search through that and see exactly what is your property and then work with it. So you are going to carry over the network a lot of information that you don't really need. And that is not helping on the performance, especially when we are discussing the mobile side. So what is the result of any of this? Well, from my experience, exaggerating with uh, any of these uh, approaches, it will end up being a mess. But I want to make a disclaimer in here, because if you are working with, you know, pretty straightforward application, and um, it does not have a lot of complexity, and, you know, the features that you're adding along the way are not that impactful, you have the business, uh, you know, not evolving that much, you can go with any of this. So it's okay, as long as you are not creating some complexity. Yeah, and as long as you can uh, work with it. But if you're discussing a big application that scales, that, uh, I don't know, maybe at the beginning it was just a startup, and right now it's a huge uh, company application, you know, so uh, it evolved a lot. Let's say, for example, applications like how we have uh, uh, Facebook, Netflix, I don't know, all the, the big platforms that we are using. Well, in this kind of situation, we have to pay very much uh, attention on what we are doing exactly in the, in the code base. And I'm just going to share with you my experience. I worked with a system that was uh, something like this. The difference was that there was only one team working with the uh, client part, and there were several teams that were working with, uh, uh, with the services, yeah, but services that were um, uh, being built around the domain. So basically, this is like, uh, you know, uh, minifying the situation in, there, in here and putting it in a, uh, in a diagram. Basically, what was happening in there is that the front-end developers were being very frustrated because besides the fact that uh, uh, we are separated by technology, yeah, front end and back end, we are also separated by communication. Yeah, we didn't have actually communication. So basically it was very hard for developers from the back end part to understand what the front end developers are doing and why they are changing everything and so on and so forth. So we started looking for all sorts of um, um, options on how to do it in order for them to understand what we are, they are building, what we are building, and how we are using what they are building, and what is happening in the, in the way the client is using this application. And we tried the uh, solutions that I showed you before. So we tried to add data to payloads and discussing with them to just add more data so we can do all the. Uh, you know, operations in our part. And we try to ask them, okay, create, please create a new endpoint that we can use that is helping us avoid doing like five calls to, to, uh, to the backend in order to get like five properties or something. And by trying all of this, we have this, uh, the following results, either one size fits all API. Basically, what is um, this concept? We've worked with APIs along the way, and when it comes to very clearly defined um, use cases, well, they are very good. But we have to pay very much attention in the moment that we try to, you know, satisfy also uh, uh, the mobile needs and also work with maybe, I don't know, maybe the front-end developers are making some uh, requests uh, regarding different browsers that they are using or different devices that they are using. So this means that as... Uh, the team that is maintaining the uh, backend part, the API, well, they are trying to satisfy a lot of scenarios. So they are trying to do a lot of things in the same place. So basically, we end up with something that is called one size fits all API. And then we blame, uh, blame REST and we say, REST is not good. We need to change to GraphQL maybe. No, it's not REST. Actually, the issue is the way that we either think about the, the architecture of the application or the way we are designing our APIs. Then the next issue that might appear, and I experienced it, it's the fact that, okay, as a client team, front-end team, you want to, you know, 
take all the information. Okay, maybe you can't discuss really well with the uh, backend team. They don't have the time to provide everything that you, you need. So you have to deal with what you have. And this means that you end up sooner or later, and I can guarantee for this, you are going to end up with something that looks very much like complexity, you know, complex business operations in the client side. And then the issue that appears or the questions that we have is, isn't this actually going against the principle that a good API should absorb complexity? Yes, because in a moment when you're uh, taking and resolving a lot of uh, uh, that complex complexity and you have a lot of operations to do when it comes to aggregating data and maybe a lot of calls that you have to uh, synchronize and things like this, there is too much complexity in the front end and your application it's not either performant, it's not either respecting, I don't know, an architectural pattern or something. So it's a bit messy. Unless there is a way to actually deal with this. And it might feel natural at this point to feel a bit stuck, to think maybe you had situations like this. Maybe you, deal, you had to deal with... Uh, this kind of, uh, you know, scenarios when you don't know what to do. So you might be thinking, okay, I have some constraints. They don't seem to really have anything with my possibility of making a decision about them. So what exactly can I do? I, I'm just trying what I can do. Yeah, if the requirements are changing, if everything is evolving, if what can I do as a developer? I'm just doing my work. Well, maybe it is something that we can do. Maybe instead of thinking about, you know, so much on uh, doing the technical changes and um, keeping this focus between, uh, focus and gap between front end, uh, between uh, client uh, teams and uh, back end teams, maybe we can for a moment just stop and think about, okay, since the front end team, teams, are the ones that are the most close, you know, the closest to, uh, uh, to the client, to the user, the end user. And they understand the needs that the user has. They understand how the user actually goes through with all the flows in our application. Would it sound crazy to actually let them create their own little server where they can do some operations? We are not the first ones thinking about this. Actually, there are some uh, not famous, but uh, you know, popular uh, uh, production ready um, and actually working with, with this approach. Uh, it started with Netflix because it's not happening only in my little tiny team. It seemed that uh, it's also something that uh, it's happening in, uh, in all the scenarios with all the applications that are uh, evolving at some point very, very quickly. So basically, what is a story from Netflix? I think that somewhere in 2012, they were thinking about the complete API redesign because uh, they had those one size fits all um, API. So they were thinking, okay, this is hard to maintain. Uh, this is hard to extend. So I really, really need to have a possibility to, you know, or work also with, uh, with a lot of devices. They realized that this type of APIs that they were having, well, were not fulfilling the need of working with different platforms. And then they realized that there were a lot of use cases and you have to create a lot of fallbacks for uh, all those uh, devices that they had to work with. So it was a decision about, okay, we have to find a way to create a layer between the uh, front end and the back end where we can do some specific operation for each and every single device type, platform and uh, whatsoever, you know, working on, um, on their architecture. Then we had the situation in SoundCloud. They pretty much had the same things. They, they were thinking about uh, switching from uh, uh, the monolith to microservices oriented or services oriented um, architecture. So they thought, okay, the reason behind this is because we also want to work with a lot of platforms. We need something that it's easier to, you know, create independence between the team. It's easier to work with, to uh, maintain, to extend and so on. So the answer was, again, that middle layer between the 
the um, front end and the back end, in which they actually did the specific operations, some of the specific operations. And this pattern is the BFF, back end for front end pattern. And what exactly is this pattern doing? Well, basically, this pattern was thought of as, you know, just thinking about developers, but most than that, thinking about users and their needs and the way we have so many random ways of using our applications and we have so many requests that no one really in the development process uh, understands. So it might seem like it's BFF, you know, be best friends forever, but it's actually uh, just a little friendship between the front end and the back end in order to be able to uh, resolve that performance and the, the shared da data that we are mentioning in the beginning. Also, as a, let's say as a very straightforward uh, definition, let's just say that the, back, the BFF pattern is helping us completely decoupling the front end from the back end. And this might, you know, we are discussing um, a middle layer. Um, we are discussing also, we mentioned something about uh, microservices, yeah, for uh, uh, SoundCloud, uh, a lot of things might seem similar, you know, to maybe some of you that use the, the API gateway and they might be thinking, okay, but why won't we just use an API gateway? Why do we have to work with a new pattern? Well, the thing is, indeed, they are both working towards uh, simplifying some, uh, some stuff in the, in the microservices oriented area. They are doing the decoupling that we were discussing also in the B back in, uh, BFF uh, pattern. The client doesn't need to know about uh, the location of the services. Yeah, so the decoupling is, uh, is complete. Uh, we don't have a dependency on the communication protocol. So maybe if we want to make any transition at some point uh, from one to another, we can freely do it or without a lot of um, um, impact for other, other areas in the application. So basically, if we think on the traditional API, uh, API gateway uh, approach, it looks something like this. We have a client, we have an API gateway that is actually working with all the services, so the client is not working with the services anymore. Yeah, it's taking care of uh, cross-cutting concerns, so everything uh, that it's, let's say, um, it has to do with the services interaction, is going through that. But how about the BFF? Well, as you can see, the difference that we have in here is that the BFF is being thought of as a little server by, client, by device type. So you can think about it like some uh, API gateway that it's for each client. But uh, for example, if we are discussing about uh, uh, maybe some of the operations that we can do in the BFF and we can do in the API gateway and uh, um, backwards, well, it depends also in the tool that we are using and what exactly uh, we are using in terms of technologies and things like this. But generally speaking, you can think about it as a way to actually satisfy the need of a specific device type. Yeah, so this is, is more specific by device. So you're going to say, okay, but since we are mentioning um, uh, the performance part, because we kept on talking about the, the data, but what about performance? Well, how is it more efficient to do a call from the client uh, through a BFF and then uh, from the BFF to the server? Why is it more efficient that it is to just do it directly? Well, you can think about this as it's more efficient to do a server-to-server -server operation than doing a direct uh, operation from the client, from the browser to the server. So you are gaining some performance in that part. Then we can think about, uh, okay, it's helping a lot on the performance because since we are gathering that data, yeah, we are just sending the, the data that uh, our uh, uh, device needs, our user interface type needs, where we are not taking all the data back and forth, working with something that we don't need. So there is also a lot of, um, a lot of uh, benefits to, to work uh, in here also. 
So if it is just to wrap them up, those benefits, we have this possibility of, you know, the backend working with uh, uh, the mobile application on some operations and doing it uh, also in the uh, in the web without having any, uh, you know, interference because they are working on different BFFs. We have the teams that can work completely uh, separated. Yeah, you don't have to stay and wait for the backend uh, colleagues to do some changes and uh, then to discover that they can do that because this is going to affect them and things like this. So you have the only way that you have to synchronize. Actually, it's about, okay, if they are just going to delete an API, maybe it's important for you to know, you know, as a front-end developer. But somehow the, uh, the communication uh, is not uh, that, uh, you know, mandatory for uh, uh, an application's uh, quality and performance and so on. Then we have the separation of concerns. Yeah, we are discussing a complete separation and decoupling in between the client and the server. The APIs are easier to maintain because you don't have to always stay and satisfy needs for another type of interface or another, uh, uh, I don't know, request from the, from the front end guys. You are just going to work with what you have, with what the requirements that you, you have. And then in that middle layer, all the operations, the specific operations can be made. We are reducing chattiness because there is not that back and forth uh, uh, row that we have with, uh, with the service from, uh, from the client and faster time to market as in if we don't have that dependency between uh, the teams, it's easier for us to just do our job, synchronize where and when it's needed, but not that much, uh, that not much complexity when it comes to uh, actually putting things together. Of course, as anything that looks good, looks workable with, looks like a solution, it also has some things that we have to uh, pay attention to. And one of the thing is avoiding business logic in the BFF. Uh, there are a lot of developers that think that since they have the, the BFF, think that, okay, maybe we can do very simple, straightforward APIs, and then all the complex logic can be handled in the, in the BFF, you know, in that middle layer. Well, this is because we forget that the middle layer, the BFF, is actually a way where we translate some data yeah, from what we have from the APIs and that we want to do that gathering. So we have to keep uh, the business logic in its place. We have to keep the uh, front end, uh, the user interfa interface very clean and not move the uh, complexity in there either because we are going back to where we began. Then it's an entire discussion about duplication. Okay, if we are going to do these BFFs, isn't that at some point we have some operations that are similar in each of them? And in here, I strongly recommend if you're thinking on working with this pattern to see exactly what is the context of your application and what exactly it is that you can trade off. And I'm going to give you again my perspective. Uh, actually, it's something, it's a, it's, it's a code that I heard uh, some time ago uh, from Sandy Metz. They were, uh, he was saying that um, duplication, it's better than the wrong abstraction. So basically, sometimes, even though we are so, you know, like some of the first principles that we have in... Um, uh, in programming and that we learn as programmers is uh, do not repeat yourself and avoid duplication is not okay. But don't overthink the abstraction, as in build first, see what is happening. And then if you see that there is something that indeed needs to be, you know, you, uh, you see some duplication in there that you have to work with, then see what you can do uh, about it. But don't overthink stuff because at some point you might abstract something that it's not actually able something that you are reusing in another part. So just try to not over-engineer, overthink, and anything that we tend to do when we get overexcited by the work that we are doing. Treat BF the BFF for its capabilities. Don't try to do, as I was saying, very complex operations in there. Don't try to ensure 
you know, some very important cross-cutting concerns, or I don't know, maybe in the area of security, uh, keep, uh, you know, everything as you would do it normally on the back end, uh, respect all the best practices on the client too. So basically don't throw everything in there and take it at something that is going to just fulfill all your needs for from now on. Very, uh, and the last one actually, uh, the, the last uh, two best practices are very well linked together because on one side, make sure how you're actually organizing your components when it comes to, uh, and when I'm saying components, I'm discussing the BFF and the services and how exactly they are going to be built and they are going to interact. Why am I saying this? Because at some point you might have uh, for, a back, uh, for a BFF, a lot of dependencies on a lot of services. And if one of those services is going down, your BFF might as well go down. Maybe you a part of the functionality or something is going to uh, be happening in there. Then you have the other operation when a lot of BFFs are being dependent on the same service. Again, you have to look also for if uh, you've been thinking, you know, see a bit the overview. See if you've thought about uh, all the scenarios and the, if the structure that you're using is okay. If you can create some fallback for this. So pay attention because you are trying to um, add into your application a pattern that is supposed to help you and not create more, uh, more issues. So how do we make the right choice between the API gateway and the BFF since you know, we have so many uh, similarities, but at the same time we have uh, also uh, this possibility. Why do we have this possibility? And maybe you can ask questions like this. First, actually, first look again at the context of your product. And in here, I'm just going to um, say something that it's not related to BFF or to API gateway or whatsoever. I'm not sure in the room, uh, I'm guessing there are developers, uh, seniors and uh, juniors, and maybe technical leads and architects and so on. No matter the grade that you have, Always, when you are starting working with an application, try to understand what you're working with. It doesn't matter if it's in the beginning, it doesn't matter if uh, you join the team somewhere in the middle of the product, you know, of the development. Try to understand what you're building, why some components are working the way they are working. Why is your little side, you know, your little task supposed to work in, you know, uh, some way? Don't just think about your work like, you know, reduce it to the daily task or the user story of the sprint or things like this. Try to understand how your work is going to impact the whole product. And maybe for the ones that are more experienced in the product or more experienced in development in general, try to help, you know, junior developers, new joiners to actually understand what you are building, what is happening in there, why you chose to go with a certain architecture or pattern. How is that going to impact some feature that uh, they are going to build? How that feature is going to integrate with everything? So going back to this, the thing is understand first your um, product. See exactly what do you need? What is the issue? What options do you have? Maybe you have different client types. Maybe you have different teams taking care of each part of, uh, of uh, your, uh, you know, system, either backend, frontend, and so on. See exactly, okay, how you are handling authorization, authentication, what is happening in there, and which of the two, because they both have a lot of uh, uh, benefits and a lot of also uh, things where you can go wrong, which of them is going to give you the highest, the highest uh, gain and the smallest cost in the end, this is what it's all about. And we were discussing about, so basically, let's say that we decided to go with the BFF. In the end, for our scenario, yeah, working with teams that were working with uh, backend and frontend, we have this uh, contract in between, yeah, uh, aggregating the data, everything feels nice. And then we encounter something that it's uh, GraphQL. What is GraphQL? Hmm. It's something that is going to replace REST. No, <laughs> please <laughs> don't consider that. As I was saying, 
we so many times are doing REST so wrong and not respecting what REST principles actually are. And then we are blaming it and we are saying like, I'm just going to use another tool because this tool is not good. Sometimes the problem, and I've experienced it myself, the problem is in front of the computer, you know, and not in the computer, just saying. So we have GraphQL. And we are going to see that GraphQL has a lot of similarities with uh, what we are discussing related to data aggregation yeah, and data management, shaping data to just throw it to, to the client in the end. So GraphQL, I'm not going to go into very many details regarding the uh, syntax and things like this, as these are things that um, we can work with, we'll take a, a tutorial. I'm not, I'm not able in two minutes to just wrap around everything that GraphQL is. But I'm hoping that from what we are going to discuss, even for the ones that maybe did not interact with it at all, it will give you an idea of what is happening. So basically GraphQL, it's a query language that is helping us to create queries in order to uh, shape and work only with the data that we need. So basically, it, you're not as we are doing in REST, let's say, even though it's not a fair comparison, but we are not bringing everything. We are just bringing what we need. So basically, the client gets more freedom on the data that is going to retrieve. Okay, seems like it's something similar with the GraphQL, with the BFF. Then we have the possibility to serve different clients. Again, yes, we don't have this restriction on the, on the BFF. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of in the same area. Makes it easy for different clients to exist and evolve. So, uh, not only that we have the possibility to work with different clients, but also they are very separated, independent from each other. And of course, if uh, the areas of the application are being independent, so are the teams that are working on those areas. So is there really about GraphQL versus BFF? Well, BFF appeared a bit earlier than, uh, than GraphQL. And um, GraphQL is not only being used for this thing, as in the idea behind the, the GraphQL philosophy and everything that uh, uh, the creators or this tool uh, thought of is not of, okay, just creating the, the, gather, the gathering data. They have a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, um, benefits that they are uh, that is bringing also in the performance part um, also in uh, the way we, we mutate data so it's a lot to to talk about basically let's just say that for example it's maybe a more like um, a tool that complements complements very nicely the bff so i can work with graphql and bff together working on the on an application. I can create my BFF, that layer, using GraphQL, but I can create it uh, also with REST. So it's no, no need for GraphQL in there. It's perf perfectly workable also with, uh, uh, with REST and, and so on. Also, GraphQL is not about you know, front-end technologies. And I, I've heard at some point that GraphQL, it's you know, only for React. So no, GraphQL is not only for React, actually. GraphQL works with, uh, you know, has uh, ways of integrating with uh, Java and uh, with Go and so on. So basically nothing, uh, nothing like that. What, where you can actually create a very nicely, uh, nice connection between the two, it's in the moment, and I've experienced this uh, kind of situation, in the moment where you maybe want to, let's say, you want to introduce GraphQL to your team and you're working with uh, different uh, services and yeah, it's a complex application with services and uh, different types of uh, uh, devices. So actually we are dealing with something, something big in there. So it isn't possible for us to uh, make changes, you know, overnight. So if you want to introduce GraphQL to the application and you think, feel that it might help you, you can introduce it by creating this kind of uh, wrapper over your services and then slowly see how you can rewrite the areas that you want to rewrite and um, replace in the end. So 
A, a nice scenario is actually this, uh, where you want to introduce and to maybe do some rewriting in your application. Of course, if you have uh, any other uh, ways that you integrated the uh, GraphQL or that you worked with the uh, BFF before, I'm more than interested to hear about them uh, uh, when, we, when we finish actually the, the presentation. So let's say that as we go uh, to the, to the uh, finish of our discussion here, maybe this would sound a bit strange to you, but I don't really believe in, you know, just being called, I'm a front-end developer. I'm a back-end developer. I'm a, a React developer. No, I'm a .NET developer. I really, really think that we have to quit identifying out ourselves with uh, a technology or a single part of the application, even though we are working on that. You know, like my focus right now is in the in the backend. That doesn't make me a backend developer, because maybe uh, before I worked in frontend. But this doesn't either make me full stack developer. And what is full stack developer anyway? We'll discuss uh, some other time about this. But the main idea is, please try to create an overview. Try to understand, even though you are not in your daily work, you are not working with. Uh, uh, doing API design, you know, just do a meeting with your uh, API designer or with your architect and ask why exactly are we working like this? Try to understand why you're working with a, a certain uh, technology. What is happening in there? How can, can I, instead of complaining about how bad my, uh, my application is or how many issues there are in my application, just try to understand what is happening in there and find solutions instead of problems. And last but not least, work on the communication. Communicate with your peers, communicate with uh, uh, the business people, try to understand if they really want the things that they are asking and come maybe with better suggestions. And going back to our uh, uh, distributed team, just try to communicate you know, front-end developers with back, the ones that are right now working on the back-end developers, you know. It's never going to be a perfect relationship, but we can work on it, it's okay. So, I really hope that my words today marked a point in your, you know, mind or in your daily work. And maybe after we finish, you just go and Google a bit something about what I've been saying in here in the last, uh, in the last hour. What I really, really believe in is that there is no magic tool that is going to solve all of our problems. What we can do is actually work towards finding solutions, analyzing the context that we have, and see which solution is the best in the context that we have. So which solution actually gives us the lowest cost and the highest benefits. Thank you very much. And let's discuss. <laughs> And now I have a confirmation that you're still here <laughs> because I can see you. <laughs> Did you have situations like this where you just had to deal with a lot of data and you didn't know exactly how to handle the communication things like, or maybe are from the architecture perspective? I don't know if you had any changes. I'm really interested in your uh, experience. And if you're raising your hands, don't do that because I won't be able to, to see you, but you can say something. Yeah, so I have a question here from the back. Yeah. Yep, I can hear you. So you can hear him better. Yay. Yeah, so <laughs> one of the questions, is, well, one, my main question is when we have systems that try to be like multi-screens and trying to use the same like tr trying to have the same feature set on a large screen for the like for the browser and then for mobile how does how does backend for front end helps when you're trying to convey the same like the same interface and the same feature set on all the platforms okay indeed as uh, as we were discussing we have to analyze if you really need this so if i'm seeing that okay 
I have almost a duplication. So the only difference that we have between uh, the mobile, let's say, the mobile type, uh, device type and the web. And I see that it's only like how the components uh, look and not really in the data that I'm showing or in the, um, uh, you know, the operations that I'm doing on a, on a mobile. Well, maybe I don't need the BFF. If I don't have to do this sort of... Uh, you know, aggregation and yeah, it's not uh, extremely different. Maybe I don't need a BFF. I don't have to work with it uh, if it's not actually satisfying some uh, uh, some scenario that is going to help me. So yeah, definitely. And also, if I have iOS and I have uh, uh, Android, well, if they are alike and only the the platform is uh, is different. I'm not going to create a BFF for one and a BFF for the other. I'm just going to create one mobile that is going to serve both of them. So definitely, yeah. If it's not needed, we are not going to add it just because it's... Uh, I have al always uh, I had this idea that just because it's fancy, it doesn't mean it has to be in your application. You need to have an application that is working very nice and not only, you know, to have like to go to your other developer colleagues and be like, I'm working with GraphQL and I'm working with the last version, hey, and with uh, React and things like this. No, because it's going to be a nightmare. With the latest uh, tools, it's still going to be a nightmare. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, but if you can speak a bit louder or just get the microphone. Yeah, oh, okay. Um, uh, my question is, this isn't uh, just uh, throwing the problem to another place. I mean, if, if you have a, a, a set of features that the backend is answering, the BFF doesn't need to be in sync with that. I mean, if, if the front end side needs another property or, or removing a property or another endpoint, it's not just the BFF that needs to be aware of that. The, the actual backend needs to be in sync with that. Yes, but for example, if you just don't need another property and you, for now, you're, I'm just thinking about cases. We can discuss, of course, uh, if you have uh, something more exact, but I'm thinking if I'm working on the front end part and I just realized that I don't need five properties out of the 10 that I'm already working with in the BFF. So actually I'm retrieving specifically. Well, it's going to be much easier for me to do this because it's in my yard. I'm working with it. I don't have to wait for someone to change that for another team, you know, for a deployment and things like this. It's something that I can do. Of course, if we have at some point, uh, some changes are happening in the, in the API, as in uh, maybe the developers are thinking about or have as a requirement to uh, delete some properties that I'm actually working with. Yes, we need that communication. So we are not 100% separate, separated, but it's still more independence than it would be if we would just consume directly those APIs. This is kind of the way I, uh, I think all the, the philosophy is uh, it's about. Is this answering your question? Okay. <laughs> In what way is not? <laughs> okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, the microphone. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I uh, I didn't have uh, to deal with this case of uh, having more data than needed, but uh, I actually have a. Uh, to deal with some cases where the front uh, calls uh, uh, various uh, APIs, uh, for example, uh, the newest APA, a uh, legacy one, a uh, read-only one uh, for uh, data retrieval. Uh, and in this case, uh, could BFF uh, be used in order to reduce the endpoint on the front uh, and then let the BFF know which API, which APA to access. Uh, will that uh, have any real advantage uh, against having three endpoints on front end? So basically, if I understand correctly, 
you have a legacy API and you have a new APIs and you're consuming both or you're working with uh, yes. both? Yes, uh, I'm working with both. Uh, and then uh, I was wondering, it's better to have on the front end uh, different endpoints to call, uh, different directions to call, or it's better to have a single one and then let that one call the other APIs? Uh, it's not really clear for me why you are using uh, two APIs that do the same. What I'm thinking is maybe you can, like, till the moment, if the new API is not the new API that is doing the th same things, that's why I'm, I, if I understand correctly, if you are not sure that it's stable and that it's uh, giving you everything that you, you need in order to replace the old one, well, maybe you can create that uh, BFF if you find that you need a, a BFF. Uh, just as I was saying, in order to make the migration, as in to, mm -hmm. uh, to work with, uh, you create a wrapper over the, the old one uh, in order to have the performance that you need, and then uh, just uh, see when you have a stable one to, to replace it, I'm, I'm thinking. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, I think we're out of time, but we can still uh, discuss. Uh, I'll be a bit around here. And if not, you can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn, and I'll be happy to connect. Thank you very much, and enjoy your amazing day at this in-person event that we've all been waiting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.